Darren met Megan by chance when he stopped by the supermarket after work to buy something for dinner for the bachelor who only came home to sleep. Darren worked as a programmer in one of the city's major firms and collided with a cart near the refrigerator section filled with semi-finished product. Oops, sorry, he apologized, smiling at the attractive girl. It's fine, she smiled back and they seemed to part ways. However, at the checkout, Darren, standing in line, suddenly felt a gentle push on his side. It turned out the same girl, pushing her cart while reading something on her phone, hadn't been paying attention and bumped into him. When she looked up, surprised, Darren joked, so you'll just drive past the checkout. Oops, sorry, the girl blushed and slyly sparkled her eyes. Probably not past the checkout. There's a security guard there. They laughed. At Darren's turn at the cash register, he paid and glanced back at the girl who was organizing her purchases. Pretty, he thought. Darren was already at his car when he saw the same girl coming out of the store with a heavy bag. Suddenly, the bag burst, and her purchases scattered on the asphalt. Darren rushed to help. He fetched the bag, and together they gathered the groceries. They introduced themselves, chatted, and in the end, Darren gave Megan a ride home. I'll call you tomorrow, Darren promised. Megan smiled happily in response. That's how their acquaintance began, which soon turned into something more significant. Megan was beautiful, intelligent, and had a good sense of humor. Darren fell in love for the first time in his life. By the age of 30, he had certainly had relationships before, but never had he thought about someone every minute. Soon, they got married, with only a few guests, some friends and colleagues of Darren, Megan's museum guide friends, and about a dozen more relatives. Darren had no family of his own. His parents had died when he was in school. His grandmother raised him, but she had also passed away, leaving him an apartment. Megan's relatives were cheerful and lively. They had a great time at the wedding. Only the mother-in-law, Mrs. Rosemary, seemed a bit distant, anxiously watching her son-in-law. Choosing the right moment, she whispered to him, son, keep Megan on a leash. Don't give her too much freedom. Why? I don't understand, Darren, slightly tipsy, wondered. She inherited the character of her late father from me. He was also a joker and a party-goer, and Megan is just the same. Well, what's wrong with that? Darren smiled. The main thing is that she loves me, he added, looking at the bride dancing with the guests. She's cheerful and lively. Is that a bad thing? Mrs. Rosemary just sighed and said nothing more. After about six months passed since the wedding, during this time the young couple managed to go on a seaside vacation and change their car. Megan, maybe we should think about a third member in our family. Darren asked his wife one night before sleep. About a third. Megan mumbled sleepily. Darling, I didn't think you were such a schemer. Oh, a child, Megan. Darren laughed. I was already getting worried, she replied, shaking off the remnants of sleep. Dreaming about the future, they lay in each other's arms. It seemed that there was no one happier than them in the world. During this time, Darren became friends with his mother-in-law. Sometimes it turned out that he devoted more time to her than to his own daughter. He would buy and deliver medicine, groceries, take her to the clinic, fix the tap in the bathroom, and much more. They often sat in the kitchen. Mrs. Rosemary talked about life. She had worked at school her whole life and could spend hours telling stories about her former students, colleagues, various situations, funny ones, Darren listened and smiled. He felt good with this woman, as if she were his mother. Megan sometimes got upset with him, saying that he was ready to run to his mother-in-law at the first call, that it wasn't right. Megan, Mrs. Rosemary is already 60 years old. It seems like not much, but she can barely walk because of arthritis and has pressure and diabetes. Diabetes, Megan was surprised. When was it discovered? Three months ago, Darren replied with a hint of reproach. And you didn't know, even though Mrs. Rosemary talked to you on the phone. Well, maybe. Lately, 
I've had emergencies at work. Checks, excursions non-stop. Darren just nodded in response, thinking that Megan, as a daughter, should be more attentive to her mother. He wouldn't mind if Mrs. Rosemary lived with them and even asked her about it. No, Darren, she waved her hands in response. I won't get along with Megan. I'll stay on my own. Did you ask her about it? No, but will she be against her own mother? Don't ask. Advise the mother-in-law. As long as I'm the one taking care of things, everyone will be calm. I'm the type that can't keep quiet. I'll start teaching Megan, and with her explosive temper, we'll just end up arguing. Darren was amazed to hear such words. Megan seemed like an angel to him, although it wasn't his business. Once they were driving back from a friend's dasha after a barbecue, Darren had a little to drink and Megan was behind the wheel. Normally, Darren rarely let her drive as she was not confident in her driving skills, but the road was clear and it was a Saturday evening. Megan, slow down, Darren remarked. Why are you speeding? You always drive so calmly. Well, you have to start sometime, she laughed. Relax, everything is fine. She turned to Darren. Watch the road, he shouted. A person? Megan looked ahead in bewilderment and confused the gas with the brake, sharply accelerating. In the next moment, she hit a girl on a pedestrian crossing. The girl flew to the side and didn't move. Darren helped his wife stop the car. Oh, God, Megan cried, gripping the steering wheel, but Darren didn't listen. He ran to the injured girl. The girl was alive but unconscious. Darren called an ambulance and the police. Megan cried on her husband's shoulder next to the injured girl, waiting for the doctors and the police. I'm afraid they'll put me in jail. No, no, I don't want to. Megan screamed, quiet, quiet. Darren reassured her. We'll hire the best lawyers. The main thing is for her to survive. You don't hear me. Megan screamed. I can't go to jail. I'm pregnant. Pregnant. Why didn't you tell me tonight? Darren embraced his wife. He was feverishly thinking. Yes, the accident happened because of them. It was clearly their f Megan couldn't endure such trials. He would take everything on himself, but he had also been drinking, and what now? Send his beloved, pregnant with his child, behind bars. He couldn't allow that. After all the proceedings, Darren was arrested. Yes, there was alcohol in his blood, and the victim was in critical condition. There was not a single mitigating circumstance, and therefore, the judge handed down a severe sentence, six years of imprisonment in a maximum security colony. He was led out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Megan wasn't at the trial. Darren understood her. She didn't need these experiences to affect the baby. Only the mother-in-law came to support him. Darren, stay strong, she shouted after him. Mrs. Rosemary, take care of your health and let Megan take care of herself, he replied. Time in prison dragged slowly, new rules, new life. It was difficult for Darren and only letters from home warmed his soul. In the first two months, Megan wrote often. She shared that the victim survived but became disabled. Darren understood that he could hardly count on parole now but another question bothered him. How was Megan? How was the child and who would be with them? His wife didn't respond for a long time and then a letter arrived. I was just starting to forget all that horror and you suddenly ask again, she wrote. After all those events, it was so hard for me. In short, I had a miscarriage. Darren felt a deep sense of guilt and regret for everything. Why did he drink then? succumbed to his friend's persuasion. They could have easily made it home without any problems. Megan would have been six months pregnant by now. Everything fell apart, but he immediately pulled himself together. It would pass. He would get out, and they would still have Megan children, and happiness. It's just a shame for that unknown girl who is now disabled. Still, Darren decided that he would definitely try to help her once he got out of prison. Darren received letters from his mother-in-law, Mrs. Rosemary. Her letters were so heartfelt and kind. Maternally, she supported Darren, 
expressing concern about his well-being. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Rosemary, Darren wrote. Everything is fine with me. Please, keep an eye on your sugar levels. I think the test strips for the glucose meter I used to buy are probably running out. Don't skimp. Buy them. As he hoped that in his absence, Megan would pay more attention to Mrs. Rosemary. After all, she had become like a mother to him during this time. Darren advised Megan in his letters to visit Mrs. Rosemary more often. In her letters, Megan persistently remained silent about whether she visited Mrs. Rosemary or not. A year later, a letter from the mother-in-law arrived, and its content shook Darren. My dear son-in-law, sweetheart, I would be very happy if you were my child. It's a sin to write such things, but sometimes I'm ashamed that I gave birth to Megan. When you married her, I thought she had matured, and it seemed like that, but in reality, she hadn't. Darren, she's running around with men. She started it even in school. I scolded her, and even slapped her once. It was all in vain. She didn't listen to me, and that's why we had complicated relationships. Then you appeared, and I thought everything would change, but no. And when they put you away, you completely lost it. Different guys visit her. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I understand that it's hard for you to hear this, but I don't want to leave with this burden because you've become dearer to me than a daughter. Darren, I'm dying. Two months ago, they found a tumor in me. It's very aggressive and growing rapidly. In short, doctors can't do anything. I have another month or two left. I'm in hospice now, writing this letter for several days. Darren, I want to ask you for something. When you get out of prison, come to the cemetery and dig up my grave. You'll understand everything later. Darren read the letter several times. Betrayal by Megan hurt deeply, but his mother-in-law's request. Did she write this because of the illness? After some time, Darren was summoned by the prison warden. He told him that his case was being reviewed. Why? Darren was surprised. New circumstances have emerged. Darren, tell the truth who was behind the wheel that evening. I've already said everything in court. Darren looked the warden in the eyes. No matter how Megan was, changing things now, blaming her, he considered it unmanly. It's just that the girl who was harmed back then came forward and remembered that it was a woman behind the wheel. This girl is persistent, seeking justice. She managed to reopen your case. The warden sighed. Darren, if you have something to say to the investigator, say it. You're a normal guy. I see that you're here by accident. Darren was brought to court where his case was being reconsidered. The victimized girl was present at the hearing. Her testimony became decisive. And also the recording. It turned out that there was a security camera in the store near the accident site, and the recording was preserved. No one was interested in it back then. And why would they be when Darren confessed to everything? But Gabriella, that's the girl's name, brought it up, and the recording clearly showed the moment of the accident and who was behind the wheel. The recordings miraculously survived. I can't live peacefully knowing that the person who maimed me is living on freely, and an innocent person is in prison, the girl explained in court. Mm. When I was crossing the road, I saw a car coming towards me with a woman driving. Later, I was told it was a man. I realized that a mistake had occurred. Everyone should be responsible for their actions. How Megan tried to wriggle out of it, shouting, crying, blaming everything on Darren, and he remained silent. It was unpleasant to see his wife behaving like that. And when the judge announced that the case was being reinvestigated, Megan nearly fainted. Why are you silent? Megan shouted at Darren. Do you really not love me at all? You were the one behind the wheel. Darren lowered his gaze. Let everyone be responsible for their actions. Soon he was released, and Megan was taken into custody. Returning to his apartment, Darren immediately started cleaning up. Megan hadn't been taking care of it lately. He found several men's belongings that clearly weren't his. It disgusted him, and he began throwing away anything that reminded him of his wife. That's when he found Megan's phone and, for some reason, decided to turn it on. 
After digging through it, he discovered a remarkable recording. Megan had apparently accidentally pressed the recorder during a conversation with a friend from the museum. Grace, is this a reliable doctor? Megan asked. I need him to write me a miscarriage certificate, and he shouldn't blabber. Don't worry, he'll do it. Just make sure to pay him. There's still money on my husband's card, Megan laughed. I won't be using my own money for this. I don't understand why you need this certificate at all. Well, why? So that Darren believes and suffers in prison, thinking it's such an unfair life. If he ever wants to verify, I'll show him the certificate. They both laughed. Darren silently clenched his fists, gritting his teeth, so his wife had deceived him with a child. Mrs. Rosemary might have known about it but chose not to speak. Remembering his mother-in-law's last letter and her strange request, Darren decided to go to... Darren learned that his mother-in-law was buried through social services, as Megan had refused to bury her. This information was shared by Mrs. Rosemary's friend, whom Darren met at the cemetery. I knew Rosemary, Mr. Edward sighed. She was a good woman. Her husband, on the other hand, was a scoundrel, always cheating. At least he died early and didn't torment her with his infidelities, and the daughter followed in his footsteps, putting nothing above him. Rosemary called me before her death and asked me to take one thing from her apartment and bury it on her grave, saying, This is for my son-in-law. What thing? Darren asked. You'll see. I suggested keeping it at my place, but Rosemary said it would be safer in the grave. After all, I'm not immortal. Here we are. A simple wooden cross. A photo of a young Rosemary. I sometimes come here, as her daughter never visits. Mr. Edward explained, handing Darren a small shovel. Dig a bit near the cross. Why? Darren still couldn't believe what was happening. Just nonsense. Darren hesitantly took the entrenching shovel. In just five minutes, the shovel clinked against something metallic. Yep, yep, nodded the old man. Soon, Darren unearthed a small box from the grave, brushed off the dirt, and carefully opened it. And he gasped. Precious stones, gold, he had never seen so much. There was also a small note. Darren wrote Mrs. Rosemary, These treasures are mine. They have been passed down to me as an inheritance. Our family is very ancient. My great-grandmother managed to preserve this box and passed it down to her descendant. That's how it was handed over, but no one ever used it. I don't want Megan to thoughtlessly squander them after my death, so I'm giving them to you. They're yours. I know you'll make good use of them. Darren was in shock. So, this is why Mrs. Rosemary asked to dig up the grave. Did you know what was inside? Darren looked questioningly at Mr. Edward. Of course I knew, he smiled. Surprised that I didn't take it for myself? Mrs. Rosemary and I had great respect for each other, and she allowed me to take a couple of pieces of jewelry from there. Don't worry. My grandchildren will have enough for a good life now. Darren carefully covered the grave, sat for a while, and then walked away. He knew what he would do with the jewelry. Selling them was not an easy task, but Darren managed, and part of the money went to Gabrielle, the girl Megan had harmed. Darren learned that she needed a costly operation, so he sent the money anonymously. However, Gabrielle somehow found out and called him from the clinic. Darren, thank you, she said. When I saw you in court, I knew you were a decent person. They talked for a bit, and Darren encouraged her before the surgery. He saw no need to hide that he sent the money. A few months later, he met Gabrielle out of the clinic, walking on her own two feet. It was a miracle. They started dating, and by then, Darren had divorced Megan and started his own successful business. Gabrielle suggested helping Megan get parole, have you forgiven her? Darren asked, surprised. Honestly, thoughts about parole had been troubling him too, as Megan's mother played a significant role in the events. I forgave her, especially now that I'm alive, healthy, and happy, Gabrielle pondered. She also knew about the treasures. Megan seems to have paid enough for her actions. How long has she been in prison? Almost two years. 
Darren found a good lawyer, asked him to handle his ex-wife's case, and soon she was released on parole. Darren didn't want to see her anymore, and Megan wasn't eager to communicate with him either. Darren transferred a substantial amount of money from the jewelry proceeds to Megan's account. It should suffice for a comfortable life for at least ten years, and if she used it wisely, perhaps even longer. From that box, Darren took only a small amount for Gabrielle's treatment and his business. The rest, he decided, belonged to the rightful owner. But Megan didn't receive the money for nothing. Mrs. Rosemary was right. A year later, while Darren and Gabrielle were strolling in the park with their two-month-old son, a strange encounter occurred. Enjoying your walk, happy? A disheveled, heavily intoxicated woman shouted after him. Darren turned around and didn't immediately recognize his former beautiful wife, Megan. You? He said. Yeah, it's me, she swayed. Do I look bad? Well, sort of, how are you? Not great, she smirked and tearfully added. Darren, everyone abandoned me. They spent my money and left. Only you truly loved me. Drunk and oblivious, she reached out to Darren. But he pushed her away and sat her on a bench. Think about your wasted life. I have to go. My son and wife are waiting. Darren ran back to his family, leaving Megan to contemplate her life, squandered in vain. She was the one to blame for everything. Thank you for being with me. Subscribe to the channel to not miss new interesting stories. Until next time.